Well, so today we're very pleased to have Dr. Shushi. So I'm sure some of you recognize her because she was a PhD student in our department and uh, she received her PhD in 2017. After her PhD, she then went to Harvard when she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Harvard Data Science Initiative. And Shu is now an assistant professor at the Department of Biostatistics at the University of Michigan. So her talk today is going to be on harmonizing EHR from heterogeneous system via automated translation of medical concepts. So Shu, thank you for accepting our invitation and we really look forward to your talk. Thank you ARD for the uh, invitation and for the introduction. And thank you everyone for coming to my talk. So I was um, preparing for my talk and I realized, I was looking back to my life at UW Biostat. I realized a few fun facts that I wanted to share with you. The first thing is um, I used to really uh, enjoy going to our department uh, seminar. And the, the thing I did was that always I will try to be the first to arrive. The reason is if you arrive late, then there's no more seat in the back row. <laughs> so if you want to sit in the back row, those are, those are uh, hot uh, locations. So you want to be there early. Although now we're using Zoom, so you no longer need to get there early. And the second thing that I realized it, when I look back is that, what, what did I got from UW Biostat? I, I got a uh, lifelong career and I also got a family. <laughs> My husband also graduated from UW Biostat. So I wanted to say to our current graduate students in the department, be, be aware of the, the students or the people surrounding you in your cohort in the department. They can be dangerous. They can become the person that you're stuck with for a long time, like my husband. So, okay, um, with that, I'll get started. So first I'd like to make a acknowledgement. This is joint work with my PhD and postdoc advisor, as well as with my uh, wonderful collaborators. So my, I am trained and shaped into a biostatistician by Dr. Patrick Hegarty and Dr. Andrea Cook. Just uh, stressing this such that you know who to blame if I said anything wrong during today's talk. Um, and here I also listed a few research institutions that I work with for this particular project. Okay, so my research focuses on developing statistical methods that can provide insights from routinely collected administrative healthcare data, such as electronic health records data, claims or registry data. So what's EHR? It's basically the digital form of the old paper-based medical record. When you visit a doctor, everything about your health, such as diagnosis of diseases, uh, treatment, vital signs, lab tests, everything will be linked to you and documented in some large database and it keeps updating. So the EHR data has been collected mainly for administrative or billing purposes. But the idea that there exists such a cost effective data source containing rich information about patient's medical history is really tempting, right? Of course we want to use it for research. But the problem is such data are not collected to answer a particular research question. And that leads to a lot of challenges. So in my research, I deal with the problem coming from data quality issues, confounding, and patient privacy concerns. So first, let me talk a little bit about why do I care so much about data quality? So in 2018, um, two years ago, the CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, they renamed their EHR incentive program from meaningful use to promoting interoperability. So basically we're currently at a stage that we have adopted electronic health record system in hospitals and we're constantly collecting data. The next goal is really to improve the sharing and integration of healthcare data across different healthcare providers. That was the hope, but the reality is EHRs, they don't talk to each other. And here's a little bit example of what do we mean by EHRs don't talk to each other. When we talk about EHR, we're talking about an ongoing stream of patients' medical record in the form of both structured and unstructured data. So structured data includes documentation of medical codes or lab test results or things like that. And unstructured data includes physicians' clinical notes, which are text, and medical images. 
Now suppose at some time, a patient visited the doctor, the patient come in with cough and fever, which will be documented by a type of medical code called the ICD code, which stands for International Classification for Diseases. D stands for disease. And then the physician may run some chest X-ray on the patient, which is documented by another type of medical code called the CPD code, current procedural terminology code, P for procedure. The ICD and CPD code have been called the billing code because what happens next is a bill will be generated and will be sent to the insurance company for reimbursement. So such codes have been standardized in order to create a common language between the healthcare provider and the insurance company, as well as across different healthcare systems. However, the problem is in reality, there's not a centralized coding rule. For example, some codes are more expensive to build, other codes may be less expensive. So this entire coding practice it can be driven by financial incentives. In addition to that, there are a lot of synonyms. So different codes might be talking about very similar diseases or very similar uh, medical treatments. So because of that, we often see that different healthcare providers may choose to use alternative codes to talk about exactly the same thing. So here I listed two different ICD-9 codes. They are the ninth version of ICD codes. There are also 10th version, 11th version. So they both talk about shortness of breath. Dyspnea literally means shortness of breath. And because those two codes are talking about the same thing or very similar things, we see that sometimes one particular study site, a particular healthcare system, exclusively use one particular code and never use the other code. In addition to such inconsistent coding between healthcare systems, the code version is also constantly update, updating. In 2015, we switched from the ninth version of ICD code to the 10th version of ICD code. So we changed from ICD-9 to ICD-10. In a few years, ICD-11 is coming. And we're talking about changing from 10,000 ICD-9 codes to 60,000 ICD-10 code. So imagine if your research data span the year of 2015, then some of your data has been recorded using ICD-9 codes, the other has been recorded using ICD-10 codes. Then you do need a crosswalk between 10,000 ICD-9 and 60,000 ICD-10. Currently, such crosswalk has been manually created. However, such mapping is actually very imprecise and contains a lot of error. So that's not really ideal. And that motivated my work. So why is this a problem? Why do we care so much about this? This is because we as biostatisticians often train statistical models such as phenotyping algorithm or causal inference, necessary models for causal inference using data, using EHR data from one particular study site. So here I've listed two different healthcare systems and oftentimes they will be uh, structured into a common data model, which is a more uni unified um, structure. And after that stage, people often think, okay, there's no more data quality issue, but that's not the case. The reason is because those statistical models takes the presence of medical code as input. That's your covariate. And if two healthcare systems use different codes to represent the same event, then the input will be completely different. So we often see that in practice, if we train phenotyping algorithm, which allows us to identify patients with a particular condition such as anaphylaxis, or if we train some uh, model to do causal inference that allows us to estimate drug effect. If we train such model using data from one site and then apply it to another site, the sensitivity and specificity can be dramatically dropped. And that's not a problem of the method, but a problem of the data, something that has to be taken care of before any statistical analysis is conducted. And because of that, that consists of my, the, the content of my talk. So today in my talk, I'm going to talk about kind of two stories. First, I will talk about how do we develop methods to detect coding differences between different healthcare systems. And then we're going to try to solve that problem by correcting for the coding differences through generating a mapping between two sets of medical codes between the two healthcare systems, which allows us to translate the languages. Okay, so here's a study that I was involved in when I was at UW. This study is called BOLD, Back Pain Outcomes Using Longitudinal Data. So that's BOLD. 
And this study enrolled about 5,000 patients that are 65 and older with back pain. The primary goal is to study the cost effectiveness of early diagnostic imaging. We enrolled patients and we collected EHR data from three major sites, which are Henry Ford Health System in Detroit, Kaiser Permanente in Northern California, and Harvard Vanguard in Boston. Now, before pulling EHR data from multiple sites, we did a very simple data quality check by looking at the proportion of medical imaging and physical therapy among the total medical procedures comparing two sites, Herifert and Kaiser. And very interestingly, we found that there's literally no physical therapy at Herifert, which is weird because we're talking about patients with back pain and PT is one of the most common procedures for um, back pain patients. That triggered our concern about data quality. So that was around the second year of my graduate study. And at that time, I was very motivated to develop some method that can scan for variation across the full spectrum of ICD and CPD codes in order to identify more of such data quality issues. And here's what we did. A very unique feature of medical codes is that they're naturally collapsible into a group of codes talking about either similar diseases or similar medical procedures. For example, FIWAS and CCS are two standard ways of grouping codes. Now with this hierarchical structure of codes are nested within groups and then groups are nested within a healthcare system, we developed both testing and estimation procedure that allows us to borrow information from across codes within the same group. And that's essentially how we found out that there's no physical therapy at Henryford. So to close up this story, what we did in the end is someone on the team made a phone call to Henryford and asked them, how come there's no physical therapy at Henryford? And they were like, of course we have physical therapy. We just use our own code to document physical therapy. So here, this site-specific code, HF0PT, where HF stands for Henryford, PT stands for physical therapy. It does not belong to any of the standard CPD code. However, it has been used as a generic code at Hereford to document all physical therapies. Now imagine if you were to conduct some research and you want to identify a cohort of patients who underwent physical therapy. And of course, you are going to use the standard code, CPD codes that are available to you. Then without any pre-screening, this will be the amount of data that could be missing in your research data. Since then, the question that has been haunting me is, do I always have to make a phone call every time I find out a data quality issue? Or alternatively, can data tell me that HF0PT, this site-specific code that we have no idea about what it means, it actually means physical therapy. Can we learn the meaning of certain codes from data? And then I went to Harvard to do a postdoc in order to solve this problem. And here is our solution. This is one idea. The idea is we can actually learn the meaning of a medical code from its context. So what do I mean by that? Let's think about uh, this graph in the bottom. Let's say this arrow here on the bottom left re represents the medical record for one patient over time. And it has been chopped into multiple timeline beams such that within each timeline beam, we're almost talking about one single visit. Now, if you look within this timeline beam, you will see that HF0PT, this site-specific code that we don't know what it means, it's always surrounded by medical codes that talk, talks about pain, either pain-related diseases or pain-related medical procedures. And we know that physical therapy often appear in such a pain-related context. So we could guess from the context that HF0PT means physical therapy. Based on that idea, what we did is for every pair of codes, we count how many times do they co-occur across all the patient timeline beams among all patients within a single healthcare system, which will give us a matrix called a co-occurrence matrix. So suppose I have 10,000 ICD-9 codes, then I can extract a population level summary matrix from this, and it will be a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix, where each entry of the matrix represents how many times for this particular pair of code do they co-occur 
across all the patient time and beings. So basically it measures overall how often do a pair of codes co-occur. This type of matrix actually tells us the mutual information or the relationship between each pair of codes. And from that, it turns out we can learn the meaning of a single code. And a little spoiler in the end, what we do is to do a simple uh, singular value decomposition. And I will talk about why we do that on the next slide. So it turns out that the computer learns the meaning of a word exactly from its context. In natural language processing, such a product has been called word embeddings. So word embeddings essentially represent a word in human language as a vector, which is a point in some language space. The direction of those word vectors tells you the meaning of the word. In particular, two words with similar meanings will be closer to each other in this language space. The idea of representing a word as vectors has been around for a very long time, but it's only recently popularized due to a set of computationally efficient algorithms called the word to vec So the word to vec essentially trains a single layer neural network and train it on a large amount of text data, and it turns out to work really well. And because of the shallow uh, structure of the neural network, you can actually mathematically show that the way they trained those word vectors, which are you know, multi-dimensional uh, vectors, is actually decomposing a matrix that's generated from the co-occurrence matrix. So essentially, I can generate a mutual information matrix from this co-occurrence matrix, and, that's, and then just simply do a singular value decomposition and take the top P uh, singular vectors such that each row here would be the p-dimensional word vector representing the meaning of the word. So that's how we generate the word vector. Now, if you think about in EHR data, each healthcare system has its own language. In this language, the medical records of patients are like texts or paragraphs or articles. And then in this article, the medical codes are like words in human language. So we could re readily apply the word to vec algorithm to train code vectors. The reason I really like code vectors is because they're data-driven. And data tells me what's the meaning of the code, what's the interpretation of those codes when they're actually used in a clinical practice setting, which can be very different from the standard coding rule. People don't follow the rules, right? In particular, if you look at this figure on the bottom left, these are a bunch of two-dimensional embeddings for ICD-9 codes. Usually, for ICD-9 codes with similar meanings, they will have very similar numeric values. For example, I could have 123.01, 123.02, and they tend to have similar meanings. However, if you look at our data-driven code vectors, 250 has been put together very closely with 790.29. And if you look at the description, both of them talk about abnormal gl glucose level, which can be related to diabetes. So such codes are picking up patterns that does not follow the standard coding rule, but is reflecting what is really happening in real world. And that's exactly what we want. We want to understand whether two different healthcare systems, each has its own interpretation of medical codes, which has led to two different sets of languages, and such that EHR data don't talk to each other. So that's a pretty convenient analogy. And then my next question was, can we do language translation? Or more specifically, can I infer a mapping between two sets of code vectors, each learned from a healthcare system? And how do we do that? So the traditional language translation methods using word to vec actually need some tailoring. If you look at the traditional method, Essentially, there are three steps, where in the first step, you're going to generate two sets of word vectors. For example, here I have a bunch of English word vectors, and similarly, I have a bunch of, I believe this is Spanish word vectors. And then once I generate those two sets of word vectors, I'm going to align the two language spaces such that I can actually talk about distance in the same space. And then eventually what we'll do is for every single English word, 
we look for what's the closest Spanish word in the same language space. And that will give us a mapping between the two sets of words. And that give us the final uh, language translation. That looks pretty nice. However, if you look through this whole procedure, you'll realize that in each step, we're actually optimizing a different objective function. For example, in the first step, when we generate word vectors, you actually max maximize the inner product. And then when you align the space, the traditional match math method aim to minimize L2 distance. And then eventually when you infer a mapping, because we're talking about vectors and we want to measure the distance, which becomes the angle of the vectors, we're going to maximize the cosine similarity. So because of that, it can lead to suboptimal results with those different objective functions. One way to solve this problem is to normalize the length of those code vectors or word vectors, such that they become unilength vectors and they lie on the surface of a hypersphere. If we're talking about two dimensional embeddings, then those normalized uh, vectors will lie on the circle. Whereas if there are three dimensional vectors, then they will lie on the surface of a ball. The rationale behind doing this is that length is essentially nuisance. It's not really useful. It's really only the direction of those word vectors or code vectors that tells you the meaning of the codes or the words. And once you normalize the lungs, it turns out that all of those different objective functions becomes unified. So that's really nice. Now I'm going to formally formalize this problem into a statistical framework. But before going into details, the kind of example I'd like, to, um, I'd like you to keep in mind is this graph in the bottom where we trained a bunch of ICD-9 code vectors using data from Partners Healthcare, which is a big a, um, healthcare system. And similarly, we trained for the same set of ICD-9 code, what are the code embeddings if I were to use data from a different healthcare system, which is the VA, Veterans Health Administration. The name of those ICD-9 codes are exactly the same, but the meaning of those codes can be quite different. So our goal is to understand whether code A in partners and code B in VA might have different names, but the same interpretation. And we call it code translation. So uh, by the way, if you have any questions, feel free to jump in uh, and uh, interrupt me. Okay, so if no further question, I'm going to go to my favorite slide of my talk. My question is, how do statisticians think about language translation? And my answer is related to a professor that I learned is recently already um, retired. If you recognize this picture, this is Dr. Scott Emerson. And one of his favorite saying is, everything is regression. So as statisticians, we're going to tackle the language translation problem in this particular setting using regression. So let me talk about the details here. Here's the setup. I'm going to use um, X and Y to denote N by P matrices, where N stands for the number of medical codes and P stands for the dimension of those generated code vectors. So usually we, in a more common settings, the sample size N correspond to number of patients. But because in our setting, the data, the code vectors are actually trained from a population level summary statistic, which is the co-occurrence matrix. So it's a N by N co-occurrence matrix. Suppose I have 10,000 ICD-9 codes, then N will become 10,000. So in our scenario, actually the sample size is how many codes are there. And P correspond to the dimension of the code vectors from the singular value decomposition. And usually in practice, P ranges from 100 to 1,000. And recently there has been new research that realized that you can even make it larger and you can potentially have better results with even higher dimension uh, code embeddings or word embeddings in natural language processing. So if you look at the toy example in the bottom, these are two dimensional embeddings for five different ICD-9 codes. And they have been ordered the same way. So think about Y consists of five ICD-9 codes trained from partners healthcare. S consists of five ICD-9 codes trained from the VA. And each row is a two dimensional vector. So it tell you the meaning of the code through the direction of this vector. And those vectors have been pre-lungs normalized. 
Now, with those multivariate variables, classical regression would assume a model where y is equal to xw plus u, in which w is the coefficient matrix and u is some uh, random noise. Now, one particular implicit assumption that we have been taking for granted is that in each row, the response and the predictor yi and xi, they are correctly linked and correspond to the same object. This might not be true in my code mapping setting. So to make this assumption more explicit, I'm going to introduce a mapping matrix called pi. So pi is an n by n matrix, and if it's a diagonal matrix, then this model will reduce back to the classical regression setting. Whereas if pi is a permutation matrix, then it essentially says that the rows in X are shuffled such that Xi no longer correspond to Yi. So the same row might not correspond to the same unit. And I, in my mind, I think of this mapping matrix pi as the dictionary. So it's like the, in language translation, you often have a dictionary that tells you, okay, for this English word, what's the corresponding Spanish word, right? Pi is the dictionary in this case. It tells me for each yi, what's the corresponding xi? So what does that mean? Particularly, each row of pi is like a pointer, which tells you for yi, what's the corresponding xi? So for example, if I look at the first row of y, this is my first ic 9 code. Then I'm going to go to the first row of my point pointer, the first row of my dictionary. In this row, the second location is 1, and the rest of them are all 0, which means the first y should be linked to the second x. Similarly, the second y here should be linked to the first x because my second pointer has 1 in the first point, and then the rest of them are 0. The third, fourth, and fifth are not mismatched because the corresponding rows are exactly the same as the identity matrix. The ones are on the diagonal, so there's no shuffling for the last three rows. I think I see a chat question. Okay, so how does the number of operations you have making up uh, each co-occurrence entries fit into a statistical framework, for example, if you have them? I see, yes. That's a very, very good question. This is a great question. So um, currently, what we did is we didn't really take into account the source data, like the sample size of how many patients are there that generated the code embedding. But if I were to tackle it in, in this particular setting, what I'm going to do is, if you think about the role of P, the size of my vector, when I do the singular value decomposition and take the top P uh, singular vectors, there is a variance, bias variance trade-off in it. If I have sufficient information, then I'm allowed to train longer vectors with larger p. Whereas if I have a smaller um, sample size that allows me to generate the co-occurrence matrix, then I'm, I'm left with smaller p. I can only have a stable um, estimate of the vector using smaller p. So in that case, you, don't, you can generate two sets of word vectors or code vectors from two healthcare systems that might have different sample sizes and with different number of P, which means essentially this W matrix might not be um, a square matrix. It can be P1 by P2. Did I just got another? Okay, thank you. Okay, so that's about the uh, definition or the structure of my model. Now, the next thing is, if you still recall, sometimes I might need to map from 10,000 IC89 codes to 60,000 IC10 codes. Then of course, of course, in addition to one-to-one -one mapping, I need to also let this mapping matrix to encode one-to-many mapping. The way we do that is to use a weight vector. So for example, if you look at the fifth code um, in partners in Y, it actually has been mapped to the linear combination of three codes in X. Some codes may be more important in interpreting uh, the meaning of this fifth code, which is indicated by higher weights. Other codes may be less important, indicated by lower weights. So essentially, the weighted average of the three directions better depicts the direction in the other side. So this pi matrix encodes both one-to-one -one and one-to-many mapping. Now, the second thing to think about is if you focus on this pi matrix, this is eventually what I try to estimate my parameter. The dimension of this matrix is n by n. 
we're talking about if I have 10,000 IC9 codes, then this is a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix. And how am I going to estimate it? Well, if you do a transpose to every single matrix here, then you will realize that this is like a regression coefficient. And I'm going to use the P columns to estimate this N by N matrix. And of course, that's too many parameters to estimate. Now, one key information that we mentioned before is medical codes are naturally collapsible into group of codes. So suppose the top two rows correspond to ICD-9 codes talking about diabetes, and the next three rows talk about heart disease. Then we know a priori that code A in diabetes does not have the same interpretation as code B in heart disease. So based on that idea, what we're going to do is to assume that pi is essentially a block diagonal matrix, which means codes do not cross match between groups. They only match to each other within the same group. And that also explains why essentially we have those mismatch problems. It's basically because codes within the same group talk about really similar concepts. So maybe if site one wants to use one particular code in this group, site two wants to use a different code, but within the same group group. By assuming this block diagonal structure, it actually helps a lot with estimation because as you can see, all the off diagonal uh, elements becomes zero. So I don't need to estimate those parameters and that's really nice. So using or incorporating the grouping information is quite uh, important for this framework. The last thing to think about is what's the role of this W matrix? The role of this coefficient matrix W is essentially to align the two language spaces. Now, when I align them, I really don't want it to stretch my vector, my code vector outside or inside of the hypersphere. I want them to stay on the surface of the sphere, which means W will be need to be a orthogonal matrix that essentially only rotate the vectors, the two spherical language spaces to align them, and it doesn't stretch the vector. So to summarize, in this statistical framework, we have two big parameters. One is the mapping matrix pi, my dictionary, and the other is the rotation matrix w. And we're going to use data that lies on the surface of the, of the sphere, and they are subject to mismatch corruption in order to estimate those two big parameters. So that's my framework. Okay, it turns out that this type of problem is not only interesting, but also have a wide range of applications. Beyond machine translation, this type of problem can also be used to solve the problem of um, multi-view geometry and drug target binding. And in fact, the field of shuffle regression is currently growing, is actually quite new. If you look at the earliest uh, pack of papers, they're all um, posted on archive around 2017. And recently there are more and more papers that pop up, so I didn't list all of them. Um, and if you look into the literature, the current stage of the research is we realize that it's, we basically can't make much progress on estimating pi unless we make a constraint on the structure of pi, such as pi is block diagonal matrix, or we make a very strong assumption on the signal to noise ratio because essentially estimating such a huge matrix is a hard problem, both statistically and computationally. Actually, someone showed that if pi is a permutation matrix, then to estimate that problem is an NP hard problem. Here, I'd like to highlight that we made two uh, contributions to the literature. The first one is that we allowed this mapping matrix to encode both one-to-one -one and one-to-many mapping instead of using the permutation matrix. The second thing is that we focused on structure, uh, spherical data, whereas in the previous literature, people focused on Gaussian data. And the key reason that we had to make those contributions is really driven by the problem. We do have to solve the problem of harmonizing EHR data between the two sides. And that's why we needed to think of this particular setting. Okay. So here's our proposed algorithm. This is called iSphere map, iterative uh, spherical regression mapping. So there are essentially three steps in this algorithm. In the first step, you're going to initialize the dictionary as a identity matrix, which essentially says, I'm going to ignore the fact that my data, the each row of yi and xi are mismatched. They don't correspond to the 
same object and just go ahead and use the raw data to estimate a rotation matrix W. And with that rotation matrix in the second step, once I am able to align the two language spaces, I'm going to estimate the underlying mismatch pattern by matching each code in one particular system to another system, which gives me the final estimate of the matching matrix pi. Now, once I'm able to understand or estimate what's the mismatch pattern, then from this mismatch pattern, I would know what are the rows that correspond to the identity matrix. And those are the rows that are not mismatched. They are correctly matched. So in the last step, what we're going to do is to use just the clean data, the correctly matched rows, to re-estimate the rotation matrix W and hope that it might give me a better estimate. So more specifically, in the first step, our goal is to find the rotation using spherical regression, which essentially aim to minimize the Frobenius distance between Y and XW under the constraint that W is a rotation matrix, it's an orthogonal matrix. So this type of problem has been called the orthogonal proquestis problem. It's a very old problem and it actually has a closed form solution. So if X transpose Y uh, describes the uh, distance in terms of the uh, angle, the spherical way of this measuring distance between vectors, then you, you essentially project X transpose Y to a orthogonal space. What that means is if I were to do singular value decomposition and I get U dV transpose, then my initial estimate W1 hat is equal to UV transpose. That's the rotation matrix. Then in the second step, what we do is essentially for every single code in Y, find the near, nearest neighbor in X. Now that they're already aligned in the same space, I can find the nearest neighbor. And what do we, how do we do that? Recall that I have a huge matrix and this, this pi matrix is block diagonal. So what we do is in the first step, there are two step steps. In the first step, we just use a ordinary least square to block by block estimate a dense matrix, a dense pi matrix. And then in the second step step, we do a so-called hard thresholding procedure. What that means is we're going to look at each row of pi. Recall that each row of pi is like a pointer. It's like one item in the dictionary. So we look at that row, and if there is a very uh, significant spike of uh, one element, one term, with a large value in the estimates from OLS, then we will hard threshold it to a one-to-one -one matching. Alternatively, if that row looks pretty flat, then we're going to hard threshold it to one-to-many mapping, which is essentially just a weight vector. And then eventually, we're going to use the estimated pi matrix to select out the rows that are actually correctly matched and use my better cleaned data to re-estimate the rotation matrix through spherical regression and hope that this is a better estimate. Now, if you look through this entire procedure, this is actually can be some procedure that can be iterative, right? I can first estimate the rotation matrix that allows me to align the language spaces. Then I estimate the pi matrix, which allow me to clean the data, select out the matched rows. That gives me a better W hat. Then I can better rotate my spherical language spaces and then get a better pi. So I can iteratively estimate my pi and W um, parameters. However, our theoretical finding actually showed that three steps already give us pretty good results. So let's take a look at what we did. First of all, a natural question to ask is, Okay, I know that I estimated my parameters using data that are subject to mismatch corruption. So these are not clean data. And this is actually very commonly seen in doing regression with data that are linked from different sources. So are the regression coefficients still consistent despite the record linkage problem, the record linkage error in the data? Our theoretical finding showed that in this spherical regression setting, um, the initial estimate W1 hat converges to the true value at under the Frobenius distance at a rate that consists of two terms. The first term talks about inherent noise in the spherical data, which is essentially inevitable. But the second term talks about how does the amount of mismatch in my data impact the regression estimates. 
and we showed that a necessary condition for consistency is sparse mismatch in the sense that the number of rows that are mismatched needs to be much smaller compared to the total number of rows, the total number of codes. In fact, it grows at a rate that's much, small, much slower than the sample size n, which is the number of codes. And this actually match up to our problem of harmonizing EHR data. In fact, when we harmonize EHR data, there are truly mismatch between codes across those two sites. However, the amount of mismatch is much smaller compared to the total number of ICD codes, which is 10,000. Now, another natural question to ask is, can we consistently estimate this mapping matrix pi, which is my eventual, my ultimate goal? I want to understand the language translation. And what we show is that under certain regularity conditions, with high probability, this whole two-step procedure of OLS by group and then followed by hard thresholding can correctly distinguish between one-to-one -one mapping and one-to-many mapping. And it can correctly map YI to XJ if the true relationship is one-to-one -one mapping. And it can also consistently estimate the weight vector if the true relationship is one-to-many -one mapping, which tells us you know, which code is more important in the interpretation and which codes are less important. The last thing is, that does this refinement step actually helps? And we showed that actually if you use the correctly matched data inferred from the estimate of pi matrix, to re-estimate the rotation matrix W, then the error term no longer depends on the mismatch, which means that it performs as good as if there's no mismatch present in the data set, which is really nice. Okay, so here is some simulation result. Um, when I did this result, I was um, quite nervous because we actually compared to uh, the method that was developed by Google. This is a team that actually invented Word2Vac. And when they invent the Word2Vac algorithm, they also proposed a way of doing language translation using Word2Vac. That's the one with different uh, objective functions at each step. And essentially here, the red ones are our uh, proposed I-sphere map, and the black ones are the uh, Google method. So we're looking at the mean squared error in the uh, spherical regression, the W matrix, and the percentage of matching error in the pi matrix. The lower, the better. So as you can see, our method beat the 2013, the long time ago, the Asian method of language translation using word to luck as all simulation study shows. So here is some example. I'm going to talk about two uh, real world examples. The first one is to map ICD-9 codes between partners healthcare and the VA, the one that I talked about before. So here on the top, I'm plotting the real uh, vectors, three dimensional embeddings for the ICD-9 codes from partners and the ones trained from VA. Each code, each point is color coded according to which group the codes belong to. And first of all, you can see that definitely we need some rotation to align those two language spaces. And secondly, actually some codes from different groups are on top of each other, which means this whole grouping information is quite important. If we don't know the grouping information, then it's very likely for us to make mistakes just due to uh, noise of the data. In the bottom are some selected results of the data-driven mapping learned from the iSphere map algorithm. On the left is ICD codes from partners, on the right are ICD codes from the VA. So if you look at this particular code highlighted here, this is 786.09 and it talks about dyspnea. And it has been mapped to the code that talks about shortness of breast 0 0.05. When I first saw this result, I didn't know what dyspnea meant. So I Googled it. And when I searched online, I realized there are a lot of um, coders, medical coders, they take that as a profession. And they are asking questions on some forum. And one particular question is, is exactly, my physician wrote down shortness of breath. Which of the two codes should I use to document shortness of breath? So our data-driven mapping is telling us that maybe in practice, as partners, people use both 0 0.09 and 0 0.05 to talk about shortness of breath. Whereas at VA, people exclusively use 0 0.05 to talk to document shortness of breath. So this is what we learned from the mapping between two healthcare systems. Another example we did is to map from two coding systems. So remember I said in 2015, we switched from 10,000 ICD-9 code to 60,000 ICD-10 code. 
And currently, the quote unquote gold standard is the GEM mapping, general equivalence mapping. This is a mapping that's manually curated. And in the bottom is a graph that depicts the relationship generated from the GEM mapping. So if you look at this, those relationships, that includes both exact mapping and approximate mapping. In addition to that, if I have sometimes I might have one ICD-9 code that is mapped to multiple scenarios of different sets of ICD-10 code. So imagine if you need to merge your data between before IC, uh, 2015 and after 2015, and the best you can do is to use the manually created gem mapping, then currently the research data, your research data, can be merged with a lot of ad hoc decisions about which of those scenarios do I choose when I merge those two data sets from different time frames. And that really calls for data-driven mapping to let data tell us which IC9 should be mapped to which IC10. And here is a selected result. This is a result that we focus on the particular group of ICD codes that talk about suicide and self-inflated injury, uh, SSI. On the top are the uh, results from manually created mapping, the GEM mapping. And in the bottom, we have iSphere map, which is data-driven mapping. The left column are ICD-9 codes, the right column are the ICD-10 codes. So as you can see, each of the ICD-9 has been mapped to the combination of two or three ICD-10 codes. The one that's always mapped to is the last one that talks about intentional self-harm by jumping from a high place. And this code is further combined with another ICD-10 code that talks about the location of jumping. So if you focus on the second line, this is a code that talks about suicide and self inflicted injury by jumping from natural sites. And the gem mapping, the manually created mapping, has mapped this code to two different ICD-10 uh, ICD codes. One is recreation area, the other is wilderness area. But our data-driven mapping actually only mapped it to one of the uh, dif two different areas, which might indicate that in practice, the coder looked at the, the, the description and they realized those two codes are really talking about very similar concepts. So they just choose one of them. In addition to that, another thing I wanted to highlight here is if you look at the width of the gray lines that uh, indicates the linkage, the ones that's generated by our proposed algorithm the lines can be either thicker or thinner, whereas the one from the manual mapping, there's no difference. The reason is our mapping actually gives you a weight vector if it were a many to one or one to many mapping. So this weight vector actually tells you how important is each individual code in terms of the interpretation or in terms of translation. And you can't get that information from GEM. Okay, so to summarize, EHR data are frequently integrated from heterogeneous sources, and we know for a fact that they don't really talk to each other between different sites. Therefore, it's really critical to harmonize data between healthcare systems before such data are being fed into a phenotyping algorithm or statistical model. However, currently existing manually created mapping are imprecise, laborious, and error-prone. And that calls for our uh, data-driven mapping. So what we propose is iSphere map. There is a typo here. It should be A in the middle. And this is essentially a scalable and automated data harmonization method. In particular, it's really nice in the sense that it doesn't really require any individual level data. And this is a big uh, deal because we usually have patient privacy concerns. And this method, all it asks is that each healthcare system just give us a co-occurrence matrix, which is the population level summary statistic that is shareable. And from that, I can generate a mapping. And the mapping can allow me to transfer the model that's trained from one healthcare system that's trained using data from one site to another site with that mapping. So this is really nice. Another thing is that it's fully automated in the sense that it's un unsupervised. It doesn't rely on any training labels. This is a little different from a lot of uh, methods in language translation where they might rely on a small set of so-called anchor labels. So those are used to train translation uh, algorithms. And I believe I reached uh, 422 and that concludes my talk. Any questions? Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the great talk, Shu. Uh, yeah, time for questions now. So 
well, maybe in the meantime, I would ask a question there. Okay. Uh, if you go to your, to your model, the one when you had the Y and X related by permutation matrix, rotation matrix, and error. Yeah. Like this yeah, one. okay. Yeah, you have an assumption of an additive error term in here. Uh, yeah, which would point. perhaps take you yeah, outside the sphere and you have normalized the data which you assume are in sphere. So how do you That is you a very good point. The reason I wrote it this way is because I wanted to keep a similar structure, but what we actually assumed is a, uh, uh, a distribution with a mean direction that's generated by essentially this part without that error. Ignore that error. And uh, it's pi xw, that's the uh, direction for the spherical data. And this error is not uh, in the sense of a additive form. So we, when we really did that, we used uh, maximum likelihood without this, uh, this form. It's, it's just a, for convenience of talking about the idea. So this is not our true data to say that. Okay, so yeah. uh, but, but in the actual model, there is an error term that you consider and that is constrained to be rotational. Yes, so uh, let me see if I have a slide for that. Um, the type of distribution we assumed is called von Mises Fisher yeah. distribution. This is a very commonly, yeah, you probably know that this is a very commonly used uh, distribution for um, unit lens uh, vectors. And for this distribution, there is a mean direction called mu i, and that essentially is the pi xw, what we used to talk about the direction, the true direction. And the error is described by a um, concentration parameter. So basically you can think of the concentration parameter like the stigma squared in normal distribution. But the difference is that when it becomes, when the noise becomes smaller and smaller, essentially the, the bunch of random directions are more and more concentrated to mu i, the mean direction, which is generated from pi sw. So that's how we uh, assume that this is our true model. The way I wrote it is not really uh, the true model. That's just a convenient way of uh, representing this. Perfect, thanks. Okay, I see a question from the chat. Uh, maybe if you can read it out loud, so yes. I'm not sure. So. so the question is, is there anything you can do in a situation where two hospital systems have very different patient, good question, very different patient populations, so their co-occurrence matrix differences could be described by covariance? That is a very, very good question. Uh, so we, we got asked a lot by, so there's a critical problem here that is not fully solved. The problem is, how do I know the, the mapping I learned, the differences in coding, uh, in coding patterns is driven by um, the way codes are used, the, code, the way codes are used to document what happened to the patient or driven by the heterogeneity in the population, the patient population. And that's a critical problem. So currently what we did is just use a one single uh, population level summary co-occurrence matrix and that and then you essentially think of the uh, rotation when you align the two language spaces, you kind of solve a little bit about the uh, heterogeneity problem in the sense that if the um, group between group variation is not so much and mainly the variation comes from within group, within the coding groups, then that indicates the coding map pattern we learned are driven by code, coding practice rather than uh, population heterogeneity. However, it is true that we can do better. For example, like um, Marlena said, we can generate co occurrence matrix that is um, stratified by covariance and then kind of uh, incorporate them into a individual mapping matrix that accounts for the population differences. So that's a very good question. Okay, and I will, I got another question that Hong Xiang wants to uh, be unmuted. How do I do that? Uh, I don't have the option yeah, today, so I'm I'll sure do it. Okay. I, I will do it. Just hang on. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Yeah. Thank oh, you. Yeah, that was a great talk. So uh, I wanted to be unmuted because my question is a bit long. I want to start with an example. So in, okay. I'm also working, I, I mean, you know that I'm working at Kaiser Permanente. Mm -hmm. And yes. I'm 
so one situation we had was that we found that when we have variable like race and ethnicity, and we found that one particular healthcare site Is it me or I think Hong Jiang got disconnected? Is that right? Oh, hi. okay. Well, Here you are. Hello. What happened? I think you got disconnected yeah. for a bit. Uh, uh, sorry about uh, that. So I was, okay. Uh, I'll just repeat that. So okay. I had, so I, we found that in one particular healthcare site, there are a lot, a large proportion of patients who have mm -hmm. unknown race compared to other sites. And we mm -hmm. were very confused why that that's the case and then we we made another call <laughs> just like <laughs> what you did and that side just said well the way they collected race ethnicity was like they first ask you whether you're hispanic mm -hmm. ask you the race so essentially the race is missing in that sense okay. for that side so i'm wondering if I apply your method to, for, so I can imagine that race ethnicity, that's also coding. And uh, I apply maybe your method between my uh, Kaiser Permanente Washington and that site. Can your model tell me there's something wrong with this? I think you're asking a very, that, that's a very good question. It's a, it's a hard question. The reason is, um, the, the, the coding is slightly different than the demographics. Um, th those are those are kind of more, um, so the way we learn the meaning, so what is the corresponding meaning of a code, it's from the context. And uh, when it comes to ethnicity, race ethnicity, it's hard to think of how do I impute the missing uh, race ethnicity from its context? You know, how are, are they, tr are different, are people from different races treated differently? And I, I can all I can assume is that's what the information that allows you to learn the race ethnicity. Or are different are people with different races uh, have different disease patterns or comorbidities? Um, maybe you have some information, but probably not a lot. So I'm not completely sure if this is a good uh, application of this method. Well, I mean, I really want to ask something more general question. For example, there are for example, I trained my model with ICD-10 codes mm -hmm. and with those very new categories. And then when I transfer it to older data with ICD-9 codes, then there's no way I can use that variable anymore. So I'm right. just, just asking, right. does, can your method just tell me I cannot do this? <laughs> You, you, uh, okay, so that, that, that I think that's a different problem. Uh, if I understand it correctly, let me say it back to you. So you're talking about you trained algorithm using newer data, which is uh, documented using ICD-10. So basically that algorithm takes into, uh, so let's say some of the covariates are, you know, yes or no, this code is present in the patient's right. record over a, a time frame, right. And yes or no, the other code is present. And then each of those indicators have a covariate. Yeah. And now you want to apply it to older data that's documented using ICD-9. And that's exactly an uh, opportunity, a situation where you can use the mapping. Currently, we're working on how to directly utilize this mapping to transfer the algorithm across time. And one way you can think about it, recall these are either one-to-one uh, -one mapping or weight vectors. So you can essentially use those weight vectors to kind of combine the beta coefficients of the ICD-10 codes into a beta coefficient that correspond to the mapped ICD-9 code. And that way you directly transfer the algorithm you train from you know, newer data to older data. So that's one possible way of doing that. So this algorithm might help. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your question. Hope you are doing good. Okay, I got another question from the chat room. Okay, Ernesto, hi. Is there a way to quantify the uncertainty of your method? Ah, good question. And how would, so the question is how to quantify the uncertainty of the estimate and how would this impact the interpretation of the mappings that we learn? That's a very good question because currently we don't have a way to quantify that. As you can see, I only talked about estimation but not inference. 
And what we're currently working on is to use a Bayesian method rather than what we did now to more conveniently generate a, a way of quantifying the uncertainty. So the answer for that is not yet, almost there. <laughs> Well, maybe then I go for our last question. Yeah, so does it make any difference if you were to swap Y and X uh, in terms of results? The reason why I'm asking is because if I understood correctly, then uh, you reframe this as a regression problem. And usually in regression, we assume that the covariates are observed without measurement errors. Mm -hmm. But here, there's no real reason, I believe, to assume that uh, Y is assumed with measurement error and X is not, and vice ver or vice versa. So I was wondering if a sort of measurement error on the covariance model could be yeah. helpful. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very good question. Uh, it does make a difference. So this method, uh, one shortcoming of this method is that it's not symmetric. Um, so if I were to map from English to uh, Spanish and then map back to English uh, using this method, you're gonna get the potentially different translation result. So you probably won't come back to the original English sentence. So that's the shortcoming of this method. And we're, we're, what we're currently doing is to formulate uh, this problem into a different framework where you can actually get symmetric mapping, but the current method doesn't really deal with, um, is not symmetric. So that's a very, very good comment. And yes, they, the both X and Y are measured with um, uncertainty. Yeah. Thanks. Perfect. Then I don't see any other questions. So then I will thank you for the great talk. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> I'm sure thank you, ARD. our participants did as well. And thank you very much. Good luck with the rest. Okay. Thank you.